Um, there have been some very interesting uh, scientific studies already looking back at the origins uh, of the terrible conflict that we witness every day in Syria. Uh, and it is extraordinary to see the, the coincidence of the start of the troubles in Syria with the, with the uh, effect of climate change impacting on the, the traditional agricultural sector uh, of Syria and the move of people uh, to, uh, to urban centers. Uh, and uh, nobody yet knows exactly, they can't say that they can put all of these things together and say this is a cause. But when you see the, 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 the scale of impact climate change has had on that country and what we have seen afterwards, it shows you why it is so important to take the opportunities that we have here this week uh, to try uh, to mitigate some of the, the, the impacts uh, of climate change. And one way of doing this, of course, is internationalization of research. Uh, there is a role, I believe a limited role for governments in this. The, the sector itself is the main driving force for collaboration. But we can, uh, and we try, uh, my government tries to, uh, to encourage the, uh, uh, the, the, the collaboration between uh, our scientific institutions. Um, we have something called the Science and Innovation Network, which we run together with uh, the British Council, whose director, Richard Roos, is here with us today. Um, uh, and I'm very glad to say that the University of Bahrain and Loughborough University have successfully bid for funding from this, uh, from this fund and their collaboration will establish a permanent research uh, centre for sustainable energy and water at the University of Bahrain linked to the Centre for Renewable Energy Systems Technology uh, at Loughborough University. Um, meanwhile, the University of Bahrain has also signed agreements with the universities of Oxford and Aston to conduct joint research on linking desalination plants using reverse osmosis technology via renewable energy systems. And this, if I may say, inshallah, is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, uh, His Excellency mentioned the importance of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. Uh, I'm glad to say that with the with the, uh, the inspiration of the, of the British Council and the support of BAE Systems. Uh, we've been uh, bringing experts in to encourage the, uh, uh, the, the, the appetite for such technological subjects among secondary school students in order to uh, inspire their choices when it comes to, uh, uh, to higher education. And sometimes it takes a bit of innovation. And last year we managed to, uh, to, to bring in a World War II Spitfire, which was then the focus of, uh, of the STEM uh, seminars, uh, which taught not only the 14 and 15 year old children uh, who came to those uh, to those uh, seminars, but also me a great deal about uh, aerodynamic theory. Um, we uh, also, I'm very glad to say, uh, will be hosting uh, uh, an event to celebrate women in science in, in Bahrain to, to coincide with Bahrain National Women's Day next, next week. So there are a number of different areas and I hope um, that uh, I will be able to, to stand here again in a year and two years' time uh, to look at the, the ways in which our very vibrant collaboration continues in this sector um, um, uh, and that Britain will continue to deserve the accolade of being the partner of choice for Bahrain in this sector uh, and indeed as we uh, move out of the European Union into a, into a new and, uh, and global position uh, it is very much incumbent upon us uh, to pursue this line uh, and to take full advantage of this. So thank you very much indeed, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to our hosts from uh, Applied Sciences University uh, and their colleagues from London South Bank. Uh, and uh, I wish everyone a very successful conference. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. The importance of research and innovation will be our next presentation delivered by Professor David Phoenix, the Vice Chancellor of London South Bank University. Your Excellencies, honoured guests, I'm delighted to be here today at this first conference that's been jointly organised between London South Bank and ASU. 
It's a fantastic achievement and I think at the outset I'd just like to give thanks to the staff from both institutions. There's an incredible amount of work that goes into an event like this and to have attracted this many delegates and created an event of, of this standing is a real testament to the work that's been achieved. So, so thank you all very much. I can't help but reflect back and it doesn't seem like over three years ago now when I, I met um, Professor Heeb, and we talked about the potential of a collaboration between our two universities. And there was a real, I felt, coming together of minds about the benefits that could be created for both the UK and for Bahrain if we could develop a true partnership a multi-touch partnership, not one that was just about shall we try and deliver courses, but one that was about trying to create a dynamic and innovative academic environment that built on expertise and culture in Bahrain and in the UK. And to do that, we were adamant that we needed to not just focus on the teaching, but to create that environment we also had to look at the research and the innovation and how we could bring that to bear here at ASU through that partnership. That time in some ways has gone very quickly and in some ways has been um, a challenging time to actually see how we can move forward and overcome the barriers in creating this concept. But progress is being made. The College of Engineering we've now put in place and it's recruiting its first students, or has recruited its first students. We've developed programs around law, which were especially interesting because it gave the opportunity for staff from both institutions to come together and see how the knowledge of both countries could create quite a new and dynamic program, looking at global law and the impact of law across different jurisdictions for the future. So the teaching development is well underway and continues to grow. This conference is part of that journey now in developing the research aspect. And I'll say a little bit later as well about the innovation aspect. But why at the outset was I so keen that when we talked about the development that it had to include research and innovation? Well, I suppose first I should perhaps define what I mean by research and innovation. Um, and I apologise if this is overly simplistic. If we have people in the audience that are, are scholars researching innovation, there are so many definitions, I'm afraid I'm just going to use my own definition for the purpose of, of, of today. But to me, research and innovation is a spectrum. At one end, you have research which, if you look at the definition, is around seeking out. It's about creation of knowledge. And that can be blue skies knowledge, it can be very theoretical knowledge, or it could be knowledge about how to adapt and transform process. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have innovation, which in my mind is around taking that new knowledge and using it to create new products or enhanced processes to the benefit of society and people. So my own research has always tended to fluctuate along that spectrum. Uh, some of the work I do in terms of um, biophysics is, is very theoretical. In fact, my wife tells me it's so esoteric she's surprised I can find anybody else to speak to about it. But other aspects of what I do is, is very applied. It's about looking at new approaches to, to healthcare and the way we, we apply um, new drug design. And I don't see any one part of that spectrum either better or worse than any other part. It's simply different. And one of the things that differentiates universities is how they mix that combination of research and innovation with their teaching to create the academic environment that's distinctive to them. Now at London South Bank, the university was first created 125 years ago. It was driven um, in terms of its formation by the Archbishop of, of Canterbury and the Prince of Wales at the time to create an institute in London that really served to help individuals reach the potential and to do so by giving them the skills that local business needed so the business could prosper. And that's still the ethos we've got today. 
But what that ethos means is that alongside the teaching, we need to be somewhere in the middle of that spectrum of research and innovation. We need to be creating ideas, but we need to be looking at how they can be applied to the needs of business, professions and society. And it's that mix of teaching, research and innovation that gives us our distinctive ethos. So for that reason alone, in terms of reputation and differentiation, it's essential to have research and innovation as part of any higher education system. Um, and you won't find any world leading university that doesn't have a mix of those components alongside the teaching. But if you break it down further, it's of vital importance to the students. Because if the teaching's over here and research innovation is over there, you haven't created a really dynamic academic environment. You've created silos. In a true academic environment, the innovation and approach and the research and knowledge feeds into the teaching and the students become part of that environment. And through that, they take away not just the knowledge and the technical skills, but they take away the skills of creativity, of critical thinking, of ability to innovate, to know how to take risks and teamwork that's so sought after by employers, business and professions. And indeed, I believe that's one of the reasons why in terms of success, if you look at uh, the university since we've really been pushing that over recent years, um, we're now 12th in the country in terms of graduate starting salaries. Um, the Economist recently analysed the data from the tax office from the UK and listed us as 30th in the country in terms of value add to students. In other words, if you looked at the salary you would expect a graduate to get and what they got, um, we add a lot more to that than many other institutions. And the Times recently selected us last month, in fact, as University of the Year for Graduate Employment. Those accolades are dependent on the research and innovation running alongside the teaching. So from a student perspective, it's essential that that's embedded within the institution. Research and innovation, though, is also vital for staff. In higher education, it's what gives staff the authority to teach, it's what differentiates those staff from teachers within schools. The accolades that we're starting to attract because of the impact of our research and innovation means that we're not just attracting um, highly prestigious um, uh, fellows such as Fulbright fellows now from the US, but we're starting to attract industry-sponsored chairs. So last month I just signed an agreement for a million pound investment in a chair focused on uh, management and innovation. Uh, we've just worked actually with a professional body to sign an agreement for funding of um, a chair looking at um, health and safety within the work environment. And the standard and standing of the work we're doing is what's attracting people of that calibre and providing them with that authority, not just to teach with the students, but to engage with industry. And then finally, of course, from a university perspective, um, there's the benefits that that differentiation in research and innovation give through finance. Our work with business means we now have over six, seven hundred small and medium enterprises working with the university on site and about 70 student startups. That gives an annual turnover of nearly 90 million pounds a year. It also gives us the ability to work with other employers to develop new research programs. We opened a recent innovation centre looking at new polymer science with industry, how you can actually develop robotics with industry to create new approaches to, to development. Um, in the first year, that attracted over 10 million euros in terms of, of support. So the power of research and innovation from a university perspective is only achieved when you look at it holistically and you balance the research, the innovation and the teaching and you use it to engage not just with the staff and the students but also um, with business. And when it's done correctly, it provides benefits to business. That's why the businesses engage, because it allows them to innovate to increase their profitability. And going back to the points that um, um, the President made at the start of his uh, this presentation, the 
impact of those skills and that innovation is what drives productivity then within the country and allows the country to develop and in so doing to provide the services and support that its community and its citizens need. So research and innovation to me is essential, not just as the president of a university, but also in terms of what it delivers for a country and what it delivers for prosperity, not just through students, but for wider society. This link in Bahrain is very important. Bahrain is a country where we have a shared history, over 200 years of history in a regulatory environment that allows us to come together as two countries to work to the benefit for both our peoples. And through the development that we're trying to create through ASU and LSBU, we're not just looking at developing the teaching, but we're looking at using those shared um, cultural experiences and the regulatory understanding we have in the two countries to now develop the research and innovation. So based on this conference, we will move forward now with the creation of a research centre looking at issues of sustainability. A lot of work is going in from the teams to look at how we can develop that so when it's launched, it will launch um, strongly. And just as importantly, we have undertaken significant work with colleagues to look at the legal framework where we can create a joint venture which will bring together business with the training and the consultancy that I've just been referring to that will allow us to move forward in terms of innovation. So we are on track to meet that original vision when we met over the coffee where we look at not just the teaching development but we empower our staff and students through research and we work to the benefits of our society not just through teaching and research but also innovation. So thank you very much. Mr. Klesplit, the Chief Executive of Chartered Institute of Building, is called on stage to deliver his presentation on the role of professional bodies in supporting sustainable futures. Your Excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a very great pleasure for me to be here on behalf of the Chartered Institute of Building and uh, a great pleasure to be supporting uh, this fantastic event and I echo uh, the comments from uh, uh, Simon and uh, around the uh, tremendous efforts and congratulations needed to the staff of both universities in being able to put this event together and make it work. The Charleston Institute of Building has been around since 1834, but having a long and glorious past is just a footnote, really, because the accent is really on the future. And when we're talking about sustainable futures, what we've done in the past counts for nothing, really, because we are looking uh, at the future. And I think that's the message, really, for all professional bodies, uh, is how do we re-engineer ourselves to deal with the future? And I know from my experience of the Charleston Institute of Building, the organization we have today is nothing like the organization that was founded in 1834, I can assure you. And every generation, it goes through a change as it responds to what's required. Uh, when I'm called on to, ask, to, to explain what professional bodies are, I, I have a very simple sort of note. And I, for me, I, I, the standard speech is professional bodies play an important role both in, in the industries and sectors they serve and in wider society. More often we go about uh, our work without much fanfare, but our impact is felt across the globe. Professional bodies raise standards, promote professional values, and tackle uncomfortable truths. They are social enterprises for the public good. So what do I mean and how does that relate to a sustainable future? Professional bodies, and particularly those with charters, uh, such as mine, have as their core obligations uh, the society they, they operate within. In mind, the CIOB actually says very little about members other than their descriptor. The focus is totally on public benefit, the benefit to society. So in discharging those responsibilities, the professions and their associated professional bodies have to be at the heart of, in, of ensuring a sustainable future because that is where the public interest and public benefit lies. 
It's not negotiable. And this applies across all professions, from construction to law to finance to engineering to medicine. So you see that uh, the various seemingly desperate professions have more in common than you might at first think. We are a practical link between academia and practice, between learning and the world of work. The professional bodies are well placed to drive the changes necessary, the conversion of knowledge into practice and vice versa. So what are some of those changes? Well, let's return to the phrase social enterprise for the public good. I think one of the most significant is the relationship between the professional and their client. And I think there is a need to look beyond the immediacy of the current task. Professionals need to have in mind the wider impact of their role. And this is where we sometimes have to face an uncomfortable truth. What is legal is not always right. And many of you will have come across such situations. A common feature we have in the construction industry is risk transfer. You know, our professionals are encouraging us to transfer risk, usually from the client down to the person least able to deal with it. And when it all goes wrong, the risk transfers all the way back up to where it should have been in the first place. And in some respects, it's a totally futile exercise. But it's legal and there's practice, but it's not always right. Too often, the professions are seen as tools of the rich and powerful to become more rich and powerful. But a wider professional's duty needs to consider society at large. To achieve a sustainable future, the professions, led by their professional bodies, need to use the moral compass. A society, a society deserves nothing less in return for the status and privileges it grants the professionals. And eventually, through using the moral compass, what is right and what is legal will converge. And there will be no ambiguities about what delivering a, state, a sustainable future means uh, as far as the professionals are concerned. And thank you very much. today, celebrating all together the opening of the International Conference on Sustainable Future. We would like to thank all the keynote speakers and strategic partners for their support and belief in this memorable conference. Professor Wahib al Khaja and Professor Ghassan Awad is called on stage to give a token of appreciation. His Excellency Dr. Abdel Ghani Shouikh, the Secretary General of the Higher Education Council. Mr. Simon Martin, the British Ambassador to Bahrain.
Professor David Phoenix, the Vice Chancellor of London South Bank University. Mr. Chris Bleeth, the Chief Executive of Chartered Institute of Building. <laughs> Professor Charles Igbo from London South Bank University. Professor Mustafa Shawi. <laughs> Dr. Roy Blatchford. Dr. Farzan Al Maraghi. <laughs> Many thanks as well for our strategic partners, London South Bank University. Chartered Institute of Building. <laughs> Higher Education Academy. William. Association of Arab Universities. No, yeah. mm -hmm. NAS Group. Gulf Insider. GD ads and events. <laughs> and finally, the Grove Hotel. Can have no group photo? Group yeah, group, group photo. photo. Yes. <laughs> Doctor Wright. Doctor Hassan, the group date. Very. The group hotel. <laughs> 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 okay, good morning and welcome back. I think we should make a start in order to benefit from the two keynote presentations. Uh, in this morning session, we have two inspirational keynote speakers. I'm, I'm really looking forward to their speeches. Uh, we'll start with the uh, first keynote speaker, Dr. Farzana Al Maragri. Uh, she's the Director of Scientific Research at the Secretary General of the Higher Education Council in the Kingdom of Bahrain. 
Uh, she has a PhD in statistics and operation research. She must be very clever. And uh, she accomplished a professional certificate in leadership from Saeed Business School, University of Oxford, UK. She was IBM certified specialist for using the statistical product and service solutions software. She has published widely many articles in the area of statistics in international referee journals and served as a referee as well. I would like now to invite Dr. Farzana on stage. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you, Professor Ghassan, for the uh, warm welcome. And uh, I'm really pleased to be here today to share with you all um, our strategies and to shed light on the uh, most important aspects of our strategies at the Higher Education Council, um, both the Higher Education Strategy and mainly the Research Strategy. So uh, thank you for your kind invitation. Um, we would really like to, to share our strategy with all our partners, the higher education institutions and, and, and our stakeholders because we are all responsible to deliver this. We are all partners in delivering this strategy. It's not us alone and it's not, not the institutions alone. So we are all together in making this happen. Um, before, um, uh, so let me just, this word, okay. Let me just go through the content so you know what we are going to talk about. Uh, first of all, we, we'll, we'll highlight some uh, recent um, uh, research data over the world and, and Arab countries in general. And then we'll see how Bahrain 2030 vision is linked to the higher education strategy and the national strategy for research. And then we'll talk about the vision of the um, research strategy, the objectives and KPIs to measure the objectives, and finally, the, the priority research areas. Um, first of all, um, let's, let's have a look how many researchers are there in, in, in the overall world. So as per researchers per one million inhabitants, the, the, the most uh, region in the world is the North America, America and, and Western Europe. They have 4,050 researchers per one million. And next is Central and Eastern Europe, 2,070 researchers per one million. Next will be East Asia and Pacific, 1,385. And all these three areas are above average of the world, which is 1,900, uh, sorry, 1,093. Then the remaining uh, parts of the world are below the average, that's the Central Asia, Latin America, Arab states. There are only 410 researchers per one million inhabitants, South and West Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. So this is as per the, the most recent statistics by the United, um, uh, by the UNESCO Institute for Statistics. Um, this, is, this map shows the uh, researchers over the world. As you see, the lighter the colors, the more researchers in those countries. So uh, we can see the, uh, the, the lighter are in the North America and um, West Europe. In terms of which countries host the greatest number of researchers, can you guess which country has the most number of researchers in the world? No? Sorry? China. China, yes. And then United States. And then Japan. So China hosts 27% of the researchers in the world. And then United States, 23%. Japan, Russia, Germany, Korea, and so on. So the share of, of word uh, R&D expenditure, uh, that's the gross expenditure on R&D by region. Um, we have the different regions as classified by, by the UNESCO. Can you guess what is the share of the Arab countries in terms of the overall research happening in the world? No, 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 no. Be, be a little bit more optimistic. <laughs> 